Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss the S Corporation. S Corporation is an example of something we called pass through or flow through entities. What does that mean? It means the entity is not taxed, not taxing paying entity. So who's taxed? Somebody will have to pay the tax. Well, guess what's going to happen? All income, losses and deduction flow. It means transfer to the shareholder on per day or per share basis. And this taxation is similar to a partnership. I'm not sure if you already learned the partnership chapter or not, but it doesn't really matter. Let me show you in a simple example, what does that mean? Let's assume we have a business. It doesn't matter what form of business we have, but let's assume we have a business. What's gonna happen is this. We are going to generate revenues. We are going to incur expenses, operating revenues and operating expenses. As a result, we're gonna have profit or net income. We're gonna call it profit for tax purposes. So let's assume for simplicity, revenues are 100,000, expenses are 30,000 operating expenses, and the profit is 70,000. So here's what's gonna happen. If this is a regular corporation, regular means C as in Charlie Corporation. What's gonna happen is this. This C Corporation will have to pay 21% on this $70,000 of profit. And let's go ahead and compute that. 70,000 times 0.21. So the corporation itself will pay 14,700. Now also to illustrate the point, let's assume the owner or the owners of this corporation takes the money out, withdraw, takes the money out because they want to use this money, they want to live. I'm sorry, takes the money what's left, 70,000 minus what I meant to say, they take the money after they pay the tax is 70,000 minus 14,700. What's left is 55,300. So that's the profit. And let's assume they take this profit out. Now they're gonna have to pay taxes on this profit based on their tax rate, whatever their tax rate is. Let's assume on average 25%. They're gonna have to pay 25% times 0.25. And that's another tax bill of 13825 So if we take 55300 minus 13825 what's left is 41475 40, 41475 after we took the money out and the money is taxed. Now, if this is an S corporation, again, this is just to make the point. If this is an S corporation, the corporation makes a generate revenues of 100,000, incur losses of 30,000. The business itself, they have a profit of 70,000 from operating expenses and operating profit. And now you're gonna see why I'm saying operating expenses and operating profit. Then what's gonna happen is this. This 70,000 flow through, pass through. This is what we mean by flow through or pass through. Goes to the shareholder or holders. It doesn't matter, you could have one or many. And the shareholders themselves, they'll pay taxes. So let's assume they're in the 25% tax bracket or 20 or whatever that tax bracket is. I'm just making up a number because each individual has a different tax bracket. So what's going to happen, let's assume they pay 17,500 in taxes. So if they take the 70,000 minus 17,500 in taxes, so 70,000 minus the taxes paid on this, What's left is 52,500 versus 41,475. So that's the idea of an S corporation. The, the S corporation itself doesn't pay taxes. The profit goes to the shareholders. Now that's, it's not only the profit, you're also gonna have other gains and deductions, which we'll talk about that later. I'm just simplifying this to make the point. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's gonna help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. So the main, the main advantage of an S corporation is the absence of double taxation. And this is just what I showed you. The double taxation don't exist for an S corporation. However, the S corporation, uh, the S corporation has limited liability, but the C, 
S corporation has a limited liability, just like a C corporation. So an S corporation gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you limited liability. Limited liability means what? If the institution, if the company is sued, if the business is sued, the shareholders will have protection, personal protection. So the liability lies in the corporation itself. It doesn't go beyond the corporation to the shareholders. So C corporation, as I just said, are tax paying entities. The corporation are taxed on their income before any distribution of dividend. Then once the distribution of dividend takes place, then the shareholder pay taxes again. So this is what double taxation is. Once again, S corporation are not subject to income taxes at the corporate level. Now I have this in yellow. You're going to see why in a moment. The taxation of a corporate income occurs after the income flows through to the shareholders. In fact, S, S shareholders are taxed on their share of the S corporation income, even if it's not, even if it's not distributed to them. So whether that distribution takes place or not, it does not really matter. You pay taxes on that profit. You remember the 70,000 profit, whether that profit is distributed or not, you have to pay taxes on that. That's important. Now, I said S corporation are not subject to income tax at the corporate level. True. However, when S corporations start, we're going to see in a moment, they start as a regular corporation and they could be for several years as a C corporation. As a result, we might have something called life or recapture rules, built in gains, passive investment income penalty tax. Don't worry, we'll talk about those in the next session. The point I'm trying to make is yes, sometime the S corporation pay taxes on a corporate level for certain items. And these are the certain items. And there is, a, there is a reason why we do so. And the reason we do so because this S corporation was a C for a, for a period of time. Now what we're gonna do next, I'm gonna show you what's called 1120S. Then I'm gonna show you the K1, which will show you the how the revenue is reported, how the expenses are reported, and how they are transferred, how the investor is informed about this information. So this is what we called 1120S, which is 1120, it's a corporation, S a shareholder or subchapter S corporation. Well, you have the name, the address, all that information up top, then here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna report your income, whatever the business we are in, so let's assume reported income of 100,000. Then we are going to report our expenses, compensation, salaries, repairs and maintenance, bad debt, blah, 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 all the expenses. And the total deductions appears to be 30,000 we have an ordinary business income of 70,000. And we have nothing else left. We have no ex excess net passive income for life or recapture. We don't have any of this, so it doesn't matter. What we're left with is 70,000 of ordinary income. Now, here's what's gonna happen. This 70,000 of ordinary income, it's gonna flow to the shareholders. So let's assume this is one shareholder, and this shareholder owns, for the sake of illustration, 30% uh, of the company. 30% of the company. So this 70,000, it's gonna to go to this shareholder. This is their form K1. And if we take 70,000, 70,000 times 30%, and this should be 21,000 times 30% should be 21,000. And this amount, 21,000, will be reported to this shareholder in this box, informing the shareholder that they are responsible for 21,000. It means 21,000 flow from the corporation to them, and they're gonna have to report this 20,000, 21,000 as income on their 1040. Maybe I should have also showed you the 1040. Then this 20,000 go to their 1040 as, think of it as, think of it as income, wages. This is basically the K1, think of it also as an equivalent of a W2 for an S corporation. This is what they report to you. Now there are more boxes here, which I'm not going to discuss now. I'm just gonna tell you what they are. Net, red, net rel real estate income, net re rental income, interest income, qualified dividend, uh, ordinary dividend, qualified dividend royalties, net short-term capital gain, net long-term capital gain, collectibles and recaptured gain, net section 1231, section 179. All of those, all of those, all these items here, they are called separately stated item. Don't worry about the, the concept now. I just want you to kind of just plant the seed for later. Separately stated means each individual get their share of these items sent to them separately. And we'll see why later. So the 21,000, we're going to call it non-separately stated item. The remaining will be separately stated items. 
Now, how do S corporation comes to life? Well, we're gonna have to make a selection. It's not selection, it's an election or a selection. It doesn't really matter. So once a corporation is formed, the assumption is the corporation is treated as a C corporation, C as in Charlie. Then immediately after it's created, we can choose to have an S corporation status. However, S shareholders can make an election to treat a qualifying corporation as an S corporation by filing a form called 2553 with the IRS. I will show you this form on the next slide. So simply put, you start as a C corporation, then immediately, instantaneously, you can say you can file this form says it doesn't have to be instantaneously. But what I'm trying to tell you is you could treat it as an S corporation. It's an election. It's you select it to be treated this way. The S status election requires a written consent of all shareholders for example when i treated my company as an s corporation i was by myself i was by myself therefore i selected s corporation i'm the majority i'm, I'm everyone I'm, i own 100 percent including those voting and non-voting you could have voting and non-voting for this s election you need the consent of all in fact each shareholder owning stock during the election year must sign for the S election, even if the stock is no longer owned at the election date. So if you were a shareholder for that year and you left, you sold, you still have to sign. If one or more owner do not consent, the election is considered made the following year. If that's the case, it it's con does not consent, the election is considered made, made the following year. Now, why that's the case? Because for a particular year, remember, the S corporation is a flow through flow through so if they let's assume we have a former shareholder here former s shareholder they don't want to select for year one or for year five well then we cannot treat the corporation as year five because they're former shareholder and they don't want to have a flow through income well that's fine then the following year what they left now we're, we are in year six and the others the remaining want to be an s corporation then it can be an s corporation but in year five even though they were a former they they sold their shares during the year we still need their consent now once a corporation gets the s status once the s status is effective when a new person come in they have no saying because they have to accept that selection they have to accept the s corporation the corporation is treated as an s corporation for income tax purposes only for the days on which the eligibility requirement for the s status are met and the election becomes effective so you are an s corporation once you become effective now this is the form 2553 matter of fact i had to fill out this form when i did my selection actually i did not do it i would let your accountant or your lawyer, lawyer takes care of this. So my accountant send it to me. I just signed it and send it back to them. But that's what the form is. Effectiveness of the S corporation. When does it become effective? In general, the S status election should be filed within two and a half months following the end of the taxable year to be effective at the beginning of the year. So if we're looking at 20X5, okay, to be eligible for 20X5, you have to file two and a half months bef before uh, before that time so as long as you elect this elect the s corporation which is basically what march 15th as long as you make the selection 20x5 march 15th you are an s corporation as of the beginning of the year if you wait after what's going to happen then you become an s corporation s corporation at the beginning of 2006 and basically what i did we didn't do the paperwork until november therefore i'm, I'm going to be an s corporation starting 20 you know, i'll be the following year Accordingly, for a calendar year corporation, if the S status is election by March 15th of the tax year, it's considered effective as, the, as of the beginning of that particular year. Otherwise, it will be effective the following year. Shareholder may obtain an extension of time for filing their consent, provided the Form 253 was timely filed and the interests of the government are not jeopardized. So simply put, you don't have to sign it that particular year they give you more time to sign it as long as the purpose is not to avoid paying taxes so let's assume a shareholder was away now these days it doesn't really matter because you can scan it send it to them they can sign it and scan it back but back in the days maybe that wasn't as easy but now it's okay so they give you more time to for everyone to sign qualifying corporation for a corporation to be eligible for s status corporation all of the following requirement must be met so this is what a qualifying corporation is why are we talking about this because 
as shareholders, you want to qualify as, if you want to qualify as an S status, you have a motive and the motive is double taxation. So if you don't, you are not a qualified corporation. So let, guess what? If you are not qualified corporation for an S, then you become a C. And what happened with C? You, there is a double taxation. So you want to make sure, so, so you want to make sure you qualify as an S corporation and you remain an S corporation. You don't want to lose your qualification. So what are the requirements? One, the corporation should be a domestic. Well, why? Because you have to pay taxes. We have to, you have, you have, you, you have to pay taxes in the U.S. Therefore, it's a domestic corporation. Remember, if you're a foreign corporation, the, they don't want you to avoid double taxation. If you're a foreign corporation and you're operating, then you have C corporation, we want the double taxation. But if you're a domestic corporation, we're giving you, the whole purpose of an S corporation is to give a break to mom and pop. So it has to be a domestic corporation, mom and pop business. The corporation must have a maximum number of shareholders of 100. Again, we're talking about relatively small corporation. Now, family members have the option to be treated one shareholder. So if you have a family member, and sixth generation, which is uh, grandfather, son, grandson, so on and so forth, they can, they if they can be, they want to be treated as one, they can be treated as one shareholder. So you could have more than one individual because a family is treated, could be treated as one shareholder. The corporation should have only have one class of stock, which is common stock. Now within common stock, you can have voting and non-voting. And this is, this is very normal. Why? I'll tell you, for example, my brother, he he gave some of his S corporation share to his kids, but he doesn't want his kids to make any decisions. So he gave them the shares, but they, he gave them non-voting shares. So you have voting share and non-voting, non-voting shares. That's okay. Those are not two different types of classes, but you cannot have a preferred stocks. Preferred stock is an, a different type of stock. So if you should prefer stock, guess what? You could lose your S status. And I saw this happen before where one corporation, because they needed more money, they negotiated with someone and someone told them, okay, I will, I, if you issue me preferred stock, I will invest. And what they did, they did, and they lost their qualifying status. So this could happen. The shareholder of the sh of the S corporation can include a resident individual. Again, you have to be a resident, resident, resident individual, single member, LLC, a LLC company, that's fine. A state, certain qualified trust and certain tax exempt organization, that's fine. They can be shareholder in an S corporation. However, non-resident alien, again, again, back to that point. Partnership, corporation, which is C corporation, most limited liability companies and most IRAs are not to own stock in an S corporation. They cannot be owners of stock in an S corporation, in an S corporation. And sometimes you might get a questions like this. Just be aware that what you what you can and you cannot be, especially about non-resident alien and a partnership. This comes all the time. Basically, one individual, they're sold their share to a partnership. You can do that. Or they're sold their share to their cousin in Europe. You can do that. Or they're sold their share to their friend in Mexico. You can do that. Once that happens, you can if you want to. That's not a problem. But the corporation loses its S status because you could... You, to qualify, you have to meet those requirements. And once you lose it, you're going to be subject to double taxation. Also, an S corporation can be partner in a partnership. That's fine. S corporation can be a partner, but not the other way around. Or a shareholder in a corporation. Notice, they can be, but those, they cannot own the S corporation, the partnership or a C corporation. However, it cannot file a consolidated return with a C corporation. And you will see why that could be an issue later. Tax year. S corporation are generally required to adopt a calendar tax year. And that's made one of the reasons why it doesn't consolidate because they want you to file for a tax year. Now, why they want you to file for a tax year generally required. Now, you could always have an exception. Why do they want you a tax year? Remember, a, a C, an S corporation, the profit flows to the shareholders. So at the end of the year, you have to compute the profit and you have to file the profit, get 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 done with this before the shareholder, which is April 15th, file their taxes. So you have to report, they have to report the profit on their individual tax return. C corporation, they could have physical year, so they, they, they may not match, okay? So other physical year may also be adopted if the corporation establishes a business purpose that the IRS finds valid. So you could have a physical year. But 99% of C S, S corporation are calendar year for that reason.
Okay, a fiscal year can be automatically approved if the corporation satisfy. We don't have to kind of worry about this. The 25% gross test under this test, more than 25% of the gross receipt have occurred in the last two months of the proposed year over a period of three years. So you have basically a seasonal, seasonal type of business. Or the fiscal year is used by shareholders owning more than 50% of the corporate tax. You remember what I told you earlier? I told you earlier that that the reason it's a, a calendar year because shareholders also they have a calendar year so you so they have to match well what happens if the shareholders if the majority of the shareholders don't ha don't use a calendar year they use a physical year then under the, under those circumstances well there is a reason to do it but again those are the exception to the rule in addition under section 444 of the of the internal revenue code s corporation are allowed to elect an acceptable fiscal year, which should be September 30th, October 31st, and November 30th, provided that some required payment related to the deferred taxes are made, assuming you make payment on the deferred taxes. They don't want you to defer taxes from year to year by selecting a fiscal year. Now, although an S-corporation are not tax-paying entities, they still have to file an informational return, which is 1120X, 1120S I showed you earlier. So yes, they don't pay taxes themselves but they have to file what we call an informational return showing the revenues, showing their expenses because they have to report the ordinary income to the shareholders. In all cases, the income tax return are required to file by the 15th of the third month following the close of the tax year. So we're talking the 15th of the third month, which is March 15th. And by March 15th, you have one month to give the K-1 to the shareholders so the shareholders can file the return. So simply put something like this. So if we are in 20X5, and now in 20X5, we, ha we have to file our return in 20X6 for 20X5. So the corporation, the S corporation, will have to complete this work by March 15th, and the individual filed the return on April 15th. So once the corporation finalized their paperwork, they have one month to send the K-1 to the shareholder where the shareholder report the, the income or the deduction or the losses on their return and they filed their tax return in 20X6. So, so that's why the, the S corporation, when I was in practice up to March 15, we would focus on S corporation. Why? Because we want to finish those. So the shareholders of these corporations get their K-1 so they can file a month later, 415. So start after March 15th, you know, we stop work on an S or we just file an extension if we haven't filed it and we start to focus on individual. Why? Because by 415th, we have to file the individual. Termination of an S collection. This is when basically when you lose it. The election of an S status remain in force until revoke revoked or lost. Sometimes, again, you can lose it. Once, termin once a terminating event, an S, an S becomes ineffective and the corporation becomes a C corporation. And for some, it's a nightmare. Now you lost it because now you're going to have to pay double taxes. Now, when do you lose it? Well, any, in any of the following situation, the first one is pretty simple. You select to do it voluntarily. The shareholders owning a majority, which is more than 50%. It doesn't have to be 100%. They say, you know what? They voted and they voluntarily decide we don't want this s election anymore it's not in our best interest that's fine more than 50 percent elect it's not like when you approve it when when you become an s 100 percent voting and non-voting to revoke only the majority in this situation the revocation must be filed by the 15th of the third month of the year to be eligible for the entire year otherwise it becomes effective as of the first day of the following year so we we're talking about march 15th here the entity no longer qualify as an S. You could lose it. This is kind of involuntarily where you kind of lost your status, lost it. In other words, it's no longer meet the S status eligibility requirement. Remember, we talked about those requirements. For example, you could have more, if you have more than 100 shareholders, that's it. You can no longer qualify. You would lose your status. Once again, the owners of the company, they don't want to lose their status because you have interest, a benefit in that flow through entity. There's no double taxation. You don't want to be double taxed. That's why you went for an S corporation. When that's the case, the election is terminated at the date at, at which the disqualification disqualification occurs. So let's assume it happened uh, January 5th, then January 6th, you, you're no longer a, an S corporation. Or the corporation does not meet the passive investment income limitation, which applies to S corporation. What is the passive investment income? You could have a certain amount of passive investment uh, in the S corporation, but not too much. If the passive investment income 
exceed 25% of gross receipts for the past three years. So they look at the past three years. And if you have passive investment income, which is basically portfolio income, dividend, uh, dividend royalties, interest, in the past three years, if your income um, for any particular year, more than 25% is passive income, then on the fourth year, you would lose your status as an S corporation. Again, you lost your status. In some cases, the IRS may waive the termination of an S corporation, provided the termination was unintentional and corrected within a reasonable period of time. So what, when would that happen? Just kind of give you an idea. Let's assume you own some shares in a mutual fund, and it's and that mutual fund made, made a large distribution. And because of that large distribution, you went over the 25%. The IRS can always waive because that's... That, that that's the right the government can always say no worries we're going to keep you an s corporation now in the past the uh, the irs were kind of mean and they wanted you to lose the s corporation because they wanted the double taxation they want more money but what's happening in the past few years or the past decade the irs are nicer and they don't want you to lose your s corporation so they could always you could explain to them what happened and they will make an exception now for example uh, let's assume Delta, an S-corporation with 100 unrelated shareholder. Emily, one of the shareholders, decided to sell 10 of her shares to a partnership in which she is a general partner. What would happen under those circumstances? A partnership cannot be an owner in an S-corporation. The S-corporation would lose their status. Now, what can you argue? I'm just saying, I'm just kind of just to make a comment here. Well, you can tell, um, you can tell the IRS, look, Emily did not know what she was doing. Um, it, it's a mistake. It was not intentional. And, you know, maybe you can sell it back. You, you will try, but I'm not saying it will work. But what I'm saying is you will try. But if, if Emily knows exactly what she's doing and she sold it, then, then that's a different story. Otherwise, you would lose your status. So let's assume Emily has a cousin in Europe and she sold 10 shares to her cousin in Europe. Well, same concept. It's a non-resident alien. Then guess what? I'm sorry, you lost your status. Short tax year. If due to the S status election or termination, a corporation was treated as a C corporation and an S corporation during some time of the year. So we have a year for part of the year. We were in a C, a C corp and part of the year we were in S corp. That's fine. Then the income is allocated between the C and the S corp based on the relative number of days under each status. Let's take a look at this example. Maya as a calendar year S corporation. That's fine. Has maintained S status ever since its formation on April 1st of the current year admitted a partnership as a 20% shareholder. What happened if you admitted a 20% partnership shareholder? You lost your status, okay? Assuming the corporation reported an ordinary income of 200,000, what is the amount of income allocated to the S tax? So basically, we were S here up until S corp, up until April 1st, and after April 1st, we were a C corp. So we have a short tax year short tax year on april 1st of the current year upon the admission the s status election was immediately terminated and the corporation became a c the corporate income is allocated to the short s corporation tax year is computed as follow we're going to take 200,000 multiplied by 312 so 50,000 is allocated to the s corporation and what happened to the remaining 150 it's allocated to the c so 50 to the s 50 to the s the first three months January, February, March, and starting in April, we became a C, and we allocate the remaining of the income to the C corporation. Re-election of the S status, let's assume you want to become a, uh, an S status again after you have lost it, you have to wait five years. So the new S status election cannot be made within five years after the termination. And that termination, you could be voluntarily terminated or involuntarily. It doesn't matter, you have to wait for five years. You have to wait, can the IRS give you a waiver? Of course they can. <laughs> You, that's the boss. The IRS may consent that an earlier election uh, is waived and they would allow you to do it. So what should you do now? Go to Farhat Lectures, whether you are a CPA candidate, enrolled agent candidate, or an accounting student. S Corporation is an important topic for the CPA exam, for the enrolled agent exam, for an accounting student. Go ahead, look at multiple choice, true, false, additional exercises. That's going to help you do better on your exam. Good luck study hard, and of course, stay safe.